So anyway, here you go. Here's your speaker. Enjoy. Good morning. Thank you all very much for coming out for what I understand is an early DEF CON morning. Um, I would very much like to show you my slides, but as, uh, as we can see, I think it might be a little bit of a technical glitch. And uh, I would really honestly love to get started, but um, it's kind of crucial to have the slides. So I thought maybe we could try the reverse and do a bit of Q&A. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, how many people are into radio? <laughs> All right, cool. How many people have, um, who, who knows what a software defined radio is? Okay. And how many people have actually played around with one? And how many people own one? Uh, how many people have a USRP? How many people have a real tech TV dongle? Cool. And who knows GNU Radio? Excellent. Well, it's very encouraging. Applause already. What? <laughs> <laughs> if I, if you, pardon me, um, debugging across the room. Do you know whether you are actually receiving the signal from my laptop? Um, would it be possible to temporarily connect one projector or something? And uh, it's actually the multiplexer back there. All right. Yeah. It's, no, you keep on going. By the way, the Q the Q and A uh, times passed. We used to have a Q and A where we'd get together and we'd go to a room to a Q and A. There's one big massive Q and A room back there, and if this gentleman over here wants to take beers and shots and whatever to talk to them at the bar, that's a good Q&A area. So this year the Q&A is pretty much going to be handled uh, out in the hallway or wherever else that y'all deem necessary. So at the end of the talk, I'll we'll have Stop. to, yeah, so. I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> so let me get this guy up and running. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I should also add that my name is Barlant Sieber. Um, as you might gather, I'm not originally from around these parts. I moved uh, to the States about the middle of last year. Um, I had been sort of mucking around with software-defined radio in my own time. I had been working on a PhD, but unfortunately for that, through a friend, I discovered what software-defined radio was about, and I just let the PhD slide in. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> And uh, I'd like to show you some of the things I, I did during that time. Uh, since then, uh, yeah. Yeah, keep on. since then, um, I actually uh, joined Edis Research, so I'm an applications engineer there. Um, and I guess one little bonus is that I get to play around with some cool new uh, toys, one of which I'd like to sort of show you today. Do you want to check the... Yeah, the, uh, no, that's the right range. Yeah, change it down to 1044. That's okay. 1024 yeah. You're right. Okay. I mean, I have another laptop. Do you want me to try that one? Can. It won't hurt, but uh, that's, that's right. That's the right thing. Okay. <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> What's my... I'm actually not much of a drinker, you know, but you will be after this. <laughs> I, I was thinking that, that might be the case. Um, I guess, I don't know, do any of you recognize this or anything like it? It's a fast track tag that you normally affix to uh, your car and it gets scanned when you go through the toll booths. Um, this is a nice antenna that you can actually read these with. And um, I figured, I can't quite remember how I came across it, but I, I came across, um, I don't know if you've see, seen, there was a black hat talk in 2008 that actually dealt with opening these up and uh, reversing, decompiling the firmware. 
Uh, that was really nice, and that was you know, quite a common vector where you go into the chip and extract the software. Um, but I figured that I would try and, and implement the radio side of it. Um, and so I just did it over two nights last week. But um, it, very simply, it will read the ID, as it's not an encrypted protocol, out of one of these tags. You just hold it up there, and it'll read it out. Um, I would have some nice images to demonstrate that a little later on. But I guess I can sort of hand wave in the meantime. Um, I don't know, I'm kind of giving you the, the summary <laughs> of the entire thing. Um, I don't know, how, how are we doing back there? <laughs> this is not quite the, the start that I was expecting. Is anybody doing any cool projects in SDR at the moment? Oh, I had a question there. Uh, you mentioned the RTL 2832? Yes, I did. Okay, well, uh, let me grab one. I carry one around with me. Thank you. All right, then. So, thanks for coming. Just wanted to tell you a little bit about me. I've always been obsessed with uh, electronics and, and wireless. I think this is in the kindergarten or first grade. I don't know what the hell I was making, but it was... Um, it contained part of an old tape deck coming out the side there and it had a blinking light with a VU meter. That was really cool for me. Um, but uh, contraptions, now obviously I'm trying to actually build it. This is um, on the top of a park back in Sydney with a friend of mine. We put together a very long wire antenna there because we were trying to pick up the Cherry Ripe number station that was supposedly broadcasting out of, out of Guam. Um, that was run by MI6, I believe. Unfortunately, we tried a, a couple of successive weekends and then realized that actually the station had already been shut down. So <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was still still fun to get the images, I guess. Um, so I'll rush through the overview then. I'll do a little bit of basic RF 101. My journey into software-defined radio to sort of shape the, my, the talk. Um, how I originally got into sort of decoding RF systems with hospital pager systems. Uh, one of my favorites, tracking aeroplanes, and um, then looking at how you can actually decode data that you know nothing about, in this case coming down from satellites. A bit of direction finding and a little bit of fast track. So, um, just to do a quick recap for those of you that aren't that experienced, the idea behind radio is that you have a carrier wave. This is of a particular single frequency, and if you were to view it uh, like this on a graph with time going from left to right, you would see your sine wave and the amplitude obviously on, on the y-axis. And the idea is that you have your information, whether it be uh, voice, for example, or digital bits. Can you hear me okay, by the way? Is this good distance? Um, it goes into a modulator, and then you mix, which is that sort of circle with the x, you mix that with the carrier, which puts it up to the frequency that you want to transmit at. So if you want to transmit you know, FM radio, then you would dial that in on your radio. Um, at the radio station, put in your music, and then out comes the, the music on that particular frequency. So the most simplest kind of modulation is called on-off keying, which is literally where you turn on and off the carry wave. And the simplest example of this is Morse code. Anyone good with the Morse code? Can you tell me what that means? DEF CON. Defcon. Correct. Um, and then it goes all the way up to the more complex stuff, which is pretty much used in all the modern digital modulations. So um, OFDM, and it's used in a whole host of ones that we use pretty much every day. Uh, so if we look at AM and FM in the time domain, you have your carrier up the very top. You have your signal just below it. And then depending on what modulation you use, you either get an amplitude modulator wave, and you can see how the carrier's amplitude is now sort of matched with that of the signal, or with the frequency modulator version, the carrier maintains the same amplitude, but the instantaneous frequency changes with the change in the signal. So that's kind of a, a sort of basic um, difference in, in some simple modulation schemes. So here's an example of um, a spectrum. This is a recording that I made. Um, of an automated broadcast from an airport regarding the state of the runways. I don't have any audio. Can I have the laptop audio back? Oh, is it? With parallel runway operations in progress. Thank you. 
independent departures in progress. So this is actually amplitude modulated. You have a carrier in the middle, and then either side you have identical sidebands that contain this voice information. Uh, so the modulation will define what it will look like on that sort of spectrum. So we're looking at AM signal, so that's symmetric about the carrier there. Uh, FM, you have the notion of a carrier, but actually because it's being frequency modulated and the frequency is moving around all the time based upon the signal, uh, it looks a little bit different. And finally, you have a digital modulation scheme, C4FM. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, but of course that's not legal. <laughs> I'll, I'll come back to more of that, that kind of thing later. Um, does anybody know about Project Penny, P25? I was about to say Pentium 25. P25, yeah, so it's a digital voice standard that's used by first responders all around the world, both uh, in America and in Australia and various other places. It's maximum. Um, and so, because it's digital modulation, this one actually is sort of an FM variant, but it contains four states. And because data is moving through very quickly, you get this sort of different um, look to it on the spectrum. So, what I'm trying to um, emphasize to you is that originally there's sort of hardware, and there's simple hardware like uh, crystal sets that were used, and it was made up of very simple components. The point was that they're all sort of fixed, they're a fixed personality. Nowadays they're more complicated, but our phones have microchips in them, and uh, these other equipment also are fixed personalities. So it's like a black box implementation, you can't get in there, you can't change it. It's not reconfigurable. Um, here we have an example of a satellite modem that's used to actually send data up into a satellite. And keep that picture in mind, because I'll come back to that. Um, so the journey begins. Uh, I had this set up on my balcony back in Sydney, and I heard this mysterious um, signal, which will not play now, but I'll do it manually. Does anybody recognize what that is? At the time, I wasn't exactly sure what it was. And I had actually tried to demod it with a, you know, free software out there that's available, but none of it worked. So I was, oh, there we go. Uh, and this was my setup at the time. I had inherited these radios from my grandfather, so a scanner and, and other receivers. And I interfaced it um, with that little board there to my 286 and had a network card running Minix, and that would stream audio uh, downstairs, and I could control the radios remotely. So this was my sort of simple setup to do that. Um, so I figured, well, I'll, I'll try looking at the signal. And it, it, once again, here we have a signal in the time domain. And then if you look at it in the frequency domain, you can see these two distinct levels coming out. And this introduces the you know, idea, just like in data transfer, that you have the preamble and you have the payload. So you can see the preamble is very important because it establishes uh, for bursty data the transmission so that the receiver can lock onto it. So there's like that repeating pattern of ones and zeros. And then you have the payload after that. Because it's two-level FSK, you can simply draw a line through the middle and slice. So anything above it will be one, anything below will be zero. Uh, and so that's what I started doing there. That's a visualization of that particular data stream. So you've got ones and zeros, great, now what? Well, the idea is to turn it into information. This took, on and off, five years for me to actually figure out. Uh, and in the process, I actually ended up writing this little bit of software that would take in this raw data and you could play around with different ways of um, you know, line encoding and, and so forth. And you know, I'd look at it every so often and come back to it. And then it just happened that I was reading Wikipedia and there was an article in there that mentioned these specific um, sync words. And I thought, well, hang on, I've seen them before. And I just happened to have the offset correct in this window and you can see that they match up. And so it turned out to be Poxag. But it was weird because the software that I had tried previously hadn't been able to decode it. So I guess this, is, this was an example of security through obscurity because they changed their, their implementation slightly. But it turned out to be the pages for the hospital network back in Sydney. And so we confirmed this. I, had a, I have a friend that works um, in the hospitals there and he called his friend and said, can you send a page out? And you can see what that test page is there, the only one that's legible. Um, but bringing it up on this um, uh, map that I created, 
it was actually part of the hospitals. You can see when we identified the frequency. So once you actually have a look at where that uh, site radio-wise is linked to, you can see that it's connected to all of the other sort of hospitals in the area. Um, so, you know, I, I let my decoder run for a little while, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and, you know, it turned out to be some, some seriously sensitive information. <laughs> and then finally... <laughs> so that, uh, that was for one of the secure systems, I believe, but anyway. Um, a side note, I just show you that map. This is sort of a more, more of an indirect call to the FCC to be more open about all the data they supposedly um, don't update on their website. But the Australian government has been very, very good and strict about maintaining all of this data in one place. So my mashup um, also has these map overlays, and this is a visualization of every single registered radio transmitter in Australia and all of the links between them. Um, so you can see where their population concentrations obviously are because that's where all the, all the radio sites are. Um, and also I derive sort of radiation information. So these are mobile cell towers in my neighborhood. And um, if you look at um, various cell towers there, you have these sort of very sharp lines coming out. And they're actually the microwave point-to-point -point links between the towers. And the omnis are just sort of the, you know, the, the panels. Uh, the government's database that I sort of imported contains information about the antennas and the orientation power and so forth. So it's, it's quite rough, but you know, it it's still looks pretty, I guess. Um, and somebody posted it to Reddit at one stage, and it was very interesting to track what sites were popular. I'm not quite sure whether you can read that, but um, one is basically they're all the Echelon sites in Australia. Um, so there's an earth station at Geraldton and, and Cajarina, I think. Um, and as you can see, they're all covered with the radomes. But these were pretty popular. That's Pine Gap. Um, and there's a bit of joint US-Australian action going on there, I think. Um, and when the very first day that I launched the site, I had visits from the US Department of Justice, federal parliament, and um, my state's attorney general's department. I have no idea how they happened upon it so quickly, but <laughs> I don't know. The other thing was, um, I think people trying to get in and, and hack the site and scrape everything up. It was mostly coming from a couple of IP addresses in Bolivia, so I just banned the entire country. <laughs> um, so that was sort of my journey into decoding things, but let's, let's move on to aviation now. Um, I have in the past generally liked to take a GPS receiver with me and sticky tack it to the window, and then when, you know, the, the what's the politically correct way of saying now, stewardess or flight attendant, um, I'm old fashioned comes up and say, oh, is that off? And I nod and say, of course it's off. Naturally, it's just got the display off. Um, but it's kind of cool because as you take off into the air, you get some pretty interesting stats about you know, how fast you're going and how high you actually are. Um, I don't know, maybe it's just me geeking out, but I like, like the numbers. Uh, and then once you get back home, you can plug it into GPS Visualizer and then into Google Earth, and you get a pretty color-coded trail of where you've actually been. Um, this was last year when I was going to Houston. Uh, and this was, yeah, just screenshots from the GPS receiver. Uh, but, you know, if you're in the airplane and you're enjoying your ride, how do the skies remain safe from collisions? How do the planes get around? Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about primary radar and secondary radar. So you've probably seen these big rotating radars at airports, and it's part of the um, ATC radar beacon system. So the primary is the big one down the bottom there, and the secondary is the one at the top. So the primary is the traditional radar, where it sends out an enormously powerful pulse and then listens for returns off metallic objects, because, of course, planes are just flying tin cans. And the range, though, is limited by the radar equation, so you have forethought or loss. What's interesting, though, is that um, with the secondary system, the top is actually directional radio, and so that will actually broadcast and ping the transponders which are active on the aeroplanes, which then reply back themselves. So that requires an active system, whereas the primary does not. Um, and because it's an active system and the transponder replies, you only have second order loss there. Um, so you can get out further, but this is quite crucial because if you're sitting in front of an old-fashioned radar scope and you have the big... Whoops. you have the big line going around, you wouldn't be able to ID individual planes. But with the secondary system augmenting that, you would actually have those anonymous blips now 
coded with the squawk code that would have been assigned when they would have taken to the skies in the first place. Um, so how does the transponder system actually work? This is a basic transponder here, and there are different modes. A will simply reply with a squawk code. So you, when you take off, ATC will give you a squawk code, like that one, and then every time your transponder is interrogated, it'll send back some pulses that ID that particular code. There's another one which is C, and that will reply with the code and the current altitude, which obviously gives air traffic control more information about the airspace. And then the cool one is mode S. Who's heard about mode S and ADSB and things like this? All right. Um, so mode S is another system that runs on top of this. And there's another cool thing that runs on top of that, which is ADSB, which stands for Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast, which means that the planes don't need to be interrogated. They will just continually broadcast this information out. And um, also part of that system is ACAS and TCAS, which are for collision avoidance. Um, but the interesting thing is that A and C are part of the secondary surveillance system. Um, and MODIS is not technically part of it, but it shares the same, the same frequency, which obviously would reduce cost. But now the problem is that there are so many planes in the sky that the channel is becoming increasingly congested. I think Frankfurt um, has this problem the most, due just simply to the amount of planes in the sky there. Um, so how does ADSB, what does ADSB send out, rather? Um, it's constantly sending out a plane's position, heading, altitude, vertical rate, flight ID, score code. So quite a lot of things, plus more, but they're the main ones. So if ATC has its antennas on the ground, then there can be transactions between ATC and the plane purely through the system. So ATC might send out a broadcast, which is called the all call, and then all the planes will reply with the downlink frame that identify the craft by its ID, much like um, a MAC address. Each uh, airframe address is assigned to a single aeroplane. And then there's also ACAS and TCAS, where the planes will actually communicate with one another. One might send an altitude request to one, and then it'll respond. And this can be used to augment collision avoidance. Obviously, if they're traveling a little bit too close, then in one cockpit, you might hear the automated voice say traffic. And then if they get really close, then there might be a pull-up in the other one to do a, a avoidance maneuver. And this is technically called a, a resolution advisory. <clears throat> but um, there have been terrible incidents in the past where pilots have not followed the RAs, and actually the planes have collided. Um, the one I've told in the past is the tragic one, I think, over uh, Germany. Um, there was a Russian flight with a lot of school children and they collided, and they all died, and then one of the fathers actually went and killed the controller. Um, so you've got to pay attention to the resolution advisories. <laughs> uh, I'd like to put big props out to um, Brad and Nick. They presented last year um, on looking into the vulnerabilities of NextGen, um, which is the FAA's sort of title for their, their next generation system that it sort of employs all this sort of stuff. Um, and I don't know whether Brad's actually here, but if you're here, it would be great to catch up. Um, so the interesting thing is a typical 747, and this is according to a, a ham friend that actually is a 747 pilot, um, it has 31 radios. So lots of different things there. And of course, that makes me pretty happy. <laughs> um, when I was flying over here, I took a photo of, of another Virgin aircraft just like the one I was on. And you can see that across the, the top of the aircraft there, there are a number of sort of bumps coming out. Um, don't quote me on these ones because I've sort of mapped it from a 747. I think it's roughly right, but you've got a TCAS antenna, the transponder, you've got high gain satellite communications on the top, you've got low gain VHF. In the tail, you've actually got an HF antenna as well. And on the bottom, you've got various sort of VHF things, and then you can't see them, but there's the radar altimeter um, and the marker and um, direction finding uh, measurement equipment too. Now, with mode S, how is that actually encoded in the air? I showed you before what a POXAG signal might look, look like, which is frequency shift keying. But this is actually uh, something called pulse position modulation, which is technically AM, but they send out pulses at very precise times. And when those pulses exist in a certain uh, manner, then it might mean a one or a zero. So 
with mode S, there's a particular preamble sequence, and the pulses have to be in exactly those positions, and that indicates that it is, in fact, a mode S packet. And then that's also used to distinguish it from mode A and mode C. And then the actual payload then is determined by the positioning of what's called chips. So this is Manchester encoded, but you have an early chip and a late chip. And you can see that one will relate to being a one, and the other one will relate to being a zero. Uh, and then the entire payload can be 56 or 112 bits long. So with pulse position modulation at those sorts of rates, a pulse lasts an incredibly short amount of time. Now, what this means is that you have to sample at a very minimum of 2 megahertz, and that's assuming that you're going to set asynchronize throughout the entire payload. And you know it requires a bit of uh, computing grunt to actually deal with that kind of data rate. And ideally, you want to sample faster so that you can correct for any um, uh, timing errors. So you couldn't be able to do this with your plain old radio. And so this is where software-defined radio comes in, and this is where I kind of um, got into it, and this was my sort of first, first play around with SDR, because it's, it's the perfect um, platform for this. So the idea is that SDR moves what was previously fixed in hardware, that's, that sort of not um, the, the unconfigurable hardware, into the software domain. So remember we had that simple crystal radio set. The expression of the AMD modulation in code, or maths in this case, is simply the magnitude of a complex vector. It's, it's incredibly elegant and simple. Um, FM is a little bit more complicated, but similarly as elegant. So the idea is that it's completely reconfigurable now. So on the receive side, instead of having everything done in hardware, all you do is you pick the carry frequency you want to listen to, mix it with your incoming signal, and then all the rest you end up doing in software. So the purpose of the SDR is simply to turn those analog values into digital and then supply the computer with a digital stream that you can process. So the continuous is then turned into discrete and quantized. Um, again, you have your wave that should look familiar. You've got your analog to digital converter to take it from the continuous into your number stream and the digital to analog converter going back the other way if you're going to transmit a signal. Naturally, you're going to transmit legally because you have a license to transmit in that band. Uh, but this is what I started playing with first. This is the USRP1. Um, it is um, sort of, you know, the, the, I guess one of the first, if not the first, sort of low-cost SDR. You hook it up via USB. Um, depending on what daughter board you got, you had a pretty amazing range to play with, and the bandwidth was pretty incredible as well. Um, this is a FunCube dongle that came out a little while later. Uh, the range was, was pretty good, but unfortunately, the actual bandwidth that you could sample was very narrow because cleverly they put an audio card in there. So the left channel would be the I channel and the right channel would be the Q channel and you wouldn't need to install any drivers because it would just appear as an audio card. But of course if you tried to listen to it you wouldn't hear anything. You needed to have the software running on top of that to demodulate whatever you wanted to listen to. And then of course there's a real tech one. Um, I don't know if anybody has used the... Has anybody used it under Windows with HDSDR or WinRAID or the like? Yeah, a couple of people. Well, I guess most people have used it on the Linux. Um, but, you know, for the price, it's, um, it's pretty cool. I don't know if you're looking at the history, but um, one of the modes under which it operates is that it can demodulate normal analog FM. And a guy called Andy Palosari happened to figure out that it's actually streaming 8-bit uh, samples of the computer, and um, the whole community sort of swarmed and, and figured out how to make that uh, available to the mainstream. Um, now, this, this thing here, um, this is not an official announcement, so I haven't put any text up there, but um, I'm pretty excited about this. This is going to be, very soon, Edis Research's new USB 3 um, radio. It has quite a frequency range, 50 megahertz to 6 gig, 56 megahertz instantaneous bandwidth, bus powered, uh, 2 by 2 MIMO. It's um, pretty sweet, and I've been having adventures with it around the Bay Area that I'll, t I'll tell you about in a little bit. But the point is you can hook all of these things up to your computer and run GNU Radio, and it has a very nice GUI uh, front end where you can describe your flow graph that will do some demodulation or modulation in this sort of graphical environment. So this one here is actually a very simple uh, demodulator for AM. You can see there that the, the USRP starts with the, the left-hand side, 
you have an FFT, so you can actually see graphically what your signal looks like. You have an AM demodulator, and then it goes out to your sound card. So it's, pretty, it's a pretty simple thing. Um, and here, if you run a waterfall over 8 megahertz, this is actually part of the 2G GSM band, and you can see uh, the broadcast control channels as well as some bursty traffic channels there. Um, and then this is a pretty cool an example of what you can do with this. This is actually 56 megahertz. So what you're looking at uh, in the middle there are two Wi-Fi channels plus extra space on the side. So you could simultaneously decode two Wi-Fi channels, for example. It's a, you know, you know, over the years, I guess, components have become faster and smaller, so it's pretty incredible uh, how far technology has come in, I guess, quite a short period of time to enable you to sort of suck up that amount of bandwidth. Um, this is another uh, example, another program. Sorry, let me go back a little bit. There we go. Um, so I was talking about pages back in Sydney. This is an example of pages in the States. Um, it uses Flex. Who, who's heard about Flex protocol? So this is the Flex um, version of the page system. And this is running a program I love called Boardline. It does FFTs very, very quickly. And you, can, you can zoom right in there. And so I don't know if you can see, but the line where the cursor is, that's actually a single frequency that pager transmissions are sent on. And I was able to zoom right in. And you know how before we saw the two levels of the uh, pager one I showed you back in Sydney. This one actually has four levels, but you can zoom right down. And if you don't know the properties of a signal, you can use this kind of analysis to figure out at the very basic level what kind of modulation they're using. So this is actually four level FSK. Um, and then I'm sure you're all aware of smart meters and how they have a mesh network, uh, often in the 900 megahertz ISM band. You can see there how quickly and how short the bursts are coming from the meters. Uh, but you can use Boardline then to once again zoom in on that, and you mightn't be able to originally tell what they are because the bursts are so short, but if you zoom in, you can see that there's some, probably some sort of phase shift keyed one there, the sort of blurrier one, the wider one in the middle, and on the left and on the right of that, there are the narrow ones. And although they're quite weak and they only appear for a very short period of time, you can still have a look and identify that they're two level frequency shift key transmissions as well. Now let's say you wanted to discover patterns or repeating periodic components to a signal that otherwise just look like noise, like, for example, anything CDMA. So the examples here are that we would be listening to um, the GPS constellation or um, CDMA from uh, the mobile phone network, for example. And um, there's a, a sync called the fast autocorrelation sync. And what it does is it um, does some trickery with some FFTs to very quickly determine whether there's sort of a repeating underlying component within a signal. So with CDMA, you have a whole bunch of signals that share the same frequency space, but uh, divided by what code they use. And so here, I don't know whether you can see, but there's a very distinct uh, line that appears on the 10 millisecond grid line. So it's mostly black, but there's a, the green line that appears up there. And that's characteristic of the 10 millisecond repeating common pilot channel information in CDMA. So you could get a signal that you didn't know about, put it in here, see the peak, and think, oh, it must be CDMA. Um, and this is really interesting, too, because if you listen to the GPS constellation, if you look at the FFT, it's all just noise. There's no apparent signal like we saw before with the pages, for instance, because the signal obviously coming from, is coming from the constellation, which is very, very far away. The signal that arrives at our receiver is very weak. However, there's CDMA in there, and there's a repeating pattern in there as well. And amazingly, doing this little bit of math, it's able to draw out the one millisecond um, repeating cyclic code in the GPS signal. So some, some pretty powerful tools that you can just um, download and start using for free. Tetra is another sort of land mobile radio digital standard. And um, it has this characteristic repeating pattern at about 14 milliseconds on an idle channel. So the cool thing is that you can take a US selfie out and about. I put this in this old used Bosch case for some electric drill I had, I think, because I didn't get mine in the case. Um, these are my amateur radio friends back in Sydney. Again, we set up a, a long wire and tried to listen to the world. The amazing thing here is that with SDR, you can pretty much capture the entire amateur radio band, which is what you're looking at there. Um, that's 25 megahertz, so it's not quite, but you know, if you wanted to use this or something, you could capture it and more. And you can zoom right down there and pick, you know, demodulate hams or 
weather fax transmissions or clandestine um, military codes and so on. These are just a bunch of hams chatting in their allocated channel. You can have digital modes like RIDI and Morse code and Hal Schreiber and all sorts of interesting things. Um, and if you don't like that, then you can... Video is supposed to start playing there. Okay, uh, you can just demodulate your local stereo FM station. But the cool thing is, this is Sutro Tower in San Francisco. The cool thing is that often modern radio stations also have data transmitted as a subcarrier, and RDS is one of the more popular ones. You can see there is, that's the baseband spectrum that you get. You have the decoder running in the background that's printing out all of the RDS information, including traffic, um, the state of traffic on the highways there, which is something that I'm very interested in. Um, and then there you can see actually the demodulated FM. So on the very left-hand side you have the mono audio, so the backward compatible with non-stereo receivers. You have the pilot tone, which is 19 kilohertz. And then you have the left minus right, which is the stereo difference channel, so that your receiver that can then recreate the left and right channels independently. You can listen to stereo audio. And then further along, the last kind of peak there is the RDS subcarrier, which uh, encodes this information. Now, one thing that really peeves me is that the location codes for the traffic information are not public in this country. Various European countries have made them public. Um, but it's just a 16-bit code that identifies some segment of the highway. And of course, if you buy a car with an inbuilt navigation system, that comes with it. But um, I don't know if you have any tips on that. I've been looking into, into one way of, of finding out this information. If you have any ideas, um, then please come and find me afterward. Uh, but if you want to do the reverse, if you want to make your own FM radio station, transmit stereo audio, and transmit your own RDS information, you can do that. There's a GNU radio flow graph that does it. And I had my little um, iPod Nano with the FM radio in it that decodes RDS, and I was just transmitting it there. And just above the, the frequency display, it's printing out some, some string that was pre-programmed in the RDS um, XML definition. So you can do that too. And I think there were, I can't remember who, um, I'm sorry to say, but there was somebody that tested sort of RDS injection and they had a navigation display in a car and it was saying there was a terrorist threat or, or frogs falling from the sky or something. <laughs> something. Weird. But uh, if you like just scanning around, if you had a normal scanner, you can do that too with GNU Radio. I have a list of frequencies down the bottom there. It just steps through each one. There's a squelch block that monitors the channel and as soon as it goes quiet, it goes to the next channel. But the beauty about software-defined radio is that you don't only have to look at a single channel at a time. Here, this is a flow graph that I put together with this multi-channel decoder block that I, I've created, where you give it a list of frequencies and it will spin up that many decoders. So if you look closely, every time there's a vertical line, it indicates that one of the channels has become active. But of course, you only have one sound card to listen to it. So the, the green one becomes the active one, and the blue one, the black ones, rather, uh, the simultaneously active. So this was just voice, but you might be listening to data transmissions and want to be able to decode them all at the same time. Or if you're listening to some trunked channel, you can record all of them. Um, SDL is also really cool because there's a free open source project to set up your very own 2G GSM base station. Um, I would have done that now. I've done it once before during the talk where I set it up using this. And I have my little phone here, and then people can sort of text me, but I thought it might be a bit distracting. Plus, late last night, I was trying to find a free channel, and the spectrum here is so unbelievably crowded that <laughs> I just gave up. Um, but it's kind of cool, because it comes with the soft switch. So for example, I've, I've set this up where I log on with my mobile phone, and then I can dial the outside world. And I allocated a number with our actual main office switch, and then I was able to receive calls when they dial that extension. And, you know, it all just goes through um, using uh, SIP over the, the network. Um, so it's kind of cool. And it had a very um, big sort of popular debut at Burning Man. And you can see that there was a bit of computation to be done, so they put the laptop on an ice pack. Um, another cool thing you can do actually now, there's um, GNU Radio blocks for decoding edit to 11A, or rather the OFDM version of Wi-Fi. So I put this AP up um, unsecured at 5 gig. This is a little flow graph there, you set the gain and the frequency. And then I made it so that it would pipe the data through to Wireshark. And you can see there, there the beacon frames coming from the AP. So this is just as if you had a dedicated wireless card running in monitor mode. 
except that it's just being done through an SDR. And in that um, picture in picture there, another laptop is connecting to the network and you'll see the, the association frame coming through and then data frames coming through there. You can see the colored ones. Um, and then actually last week, um, a colleague of mine thought he'd bring in his fancy antenna and we would try and receive pictures which are sent down from weather satellites. So they orbit the Earth, take photos, and then send them down. And you have to track them manually because they're low or Earth orbit. But the, the B200, this, this guy's just hanging there by the USB cable. Um, and then you get these sort of pictures. And you see that inter interference there because, of course, you're doing the tracking manually and you can't see it. So we're just kind of guesstimating where it would be. And I guess, I guess we missed a spot. <laughs> but uh, it's kind of cool because this is actually the west coast up here of the United States. Um, and some big cloud formations, these pictures are taken with different sensors and you can combine them into sort of these false colour images to get an idea of what's happening. This is like, I think, sea temperature and there's another thermal one. Uh, and they're happening all the time. You can just get a program to tell you when the next pass will be and, and decode that. Um, another one, if you're looking for positional stuff on the water, most large or, or medium-sized marine vessels now contain their own version of transponders. So I went over to um, the bay in San Francisco, and so that boat there just came around there. You can see the kind of trail there, and there are those other three boats with that very large cargo um, ship, and they're all um, uh, you know, plotting, sending out their information. And I guess the thing to bear in mind during all of this is this is all, all unencrypted. The thing about RF is that it's a shared channel. It's like a human resource. Anybody can do anything with it. It's only you know, our, our legal system or jurisdiction that dictates, apparently, how we're supposed to transmit or not uh, within those frequencies. So security is obviously a very, very big uh, point that hasn't been addressed in a lot of these systems. Um, so it's been used in radio astronomy, passive radar, tracking people with their mobile phones through shopping malls and so on. But let's come back to aviation. When we were talking about that radar, there's a radar turning right there. This is the radar at Moffat Air Force Base um, in the Bay Area. You can see that every time it points toward the camera where I have the radio, there's a massive spike because, of course, the radio is directly in line with the big pulse that's coming out. What's also kind of cool is that on the left-hand side, you can see the various other small spikes coming out. They're actually reflections off large buildings. So the radar signal is hitting those buildings and then hitting back into the radio. Um, so, uh, and the other thing is that I couldn't figure out what, why I was seeing two peaks here. This is showing the time in between the initial bang that's sent out, the initial pulse that's sent out by the radar. And this is called the pulse repetition frequency. And I couldn't figure out why there were two. Usually there's only one. Um, before I had an SDR that went up this high, I actually, who knows the ubiquity SR4C um, 802.11a Wi-Fi cards, yeah? Um, I sort of mucked around with the drivers a little bit. It's got uh, in the chipset a radar detection capability. So I was using that to try and characterize the weather radar nearby. But um, I only saw a single peak. But here there were two. And I did a little bit of research. And actually, these radars, apart from monitoring aircraft, can also be made to monitor weather. And in this dual PRF mode, there were some papers written about how they can be used to sort of monitor um, reflectivity and, and moisture in the air. That was kind of cool. So this is, on the waterfall display anyway, what transponder, um, MODES transponders look like coming from aircraft. We've sort of come full circle now. Uh, if you look at it uh, after demodulating an AM, then you can see we have the preamble out the front and then the payload after that. And what does that actually look like? All those little dots represent a frame, and if you were to run it real time, you would see something like that. And the, Amplitudes are obviously different all the time because you're receiving it from planes that are all sorts of distances away from your receiver. So once you've done all that decoding, what's next? Well, this is a little project I've been working on now and then. Who's seen sneakers? Yeah, thought so. Um, this is my, one of my favorite bits in the film. I'm not going to do an American accent, but Carl, get the diagnostics. What's in the little black book? Um, and you can see there on the screen is actually a very sort of um, simple picture of the Bay Area with air traffic control and planes. Um, and I kind of put together my own system that does it, that San Francisco airport right there, and I just left it running. And these are the planes that fly in and out of the area, San Francisco, um, San Jose, and Oakland. Um, 
and so they leave nice trails behind and it's kind of cool then because you can see what the flight paths are. Now this is what I call the rainbow effect. This is actually a bad transponder on, air, on an aircraft that's reporting false position information and you get nice sort of floral pictures like that, floral motif. But you know, you can see how SFO is actually right in the center there and the color code indicates altitude, so the yellow is, is just before it's about to land. Um, this is the airport there with the, the various runways. Obviously, we all know that there was a bit of an accident down there recently. Um, but I sort of went up the top of a car park nearby. This is one runway, um, and I had the B200 the there receiving. And I happened to catch these two planes coming in with parallel approach. You can see that one just touched down as it turned from green to red, and that one's about to turn red as well once the wheels hit the tarmac. And then they will scoot across the screen as they taxi back to the terminal. Um, so landings are cool, takeoffs are kind of cool too, especially if you're just sitting there you can see all the, all the planes at the, at the holding point waiting to sort of take off. Um, I think this is a Virgin flight, there it goes, and it, it's again kind of neat, remember I had the GPS here, we're watching the velocities increase and um, eventually when the wheel nose wheel lifts up, turns green and, and off, off it goes into the sky. Uh, but wouldn't it be cool if you could do it in 3D as well? So that's the same plane, now streaming in, in Google Earth through the internet. You can see um, planes there in the background landing, landing at, um, at uh, what's that, Oakland. Um, so that's Bay, Bay Area there. Uh, and wouldn't it also be cool if you could actually have a virtual cockpit mode so that you could be in the seat of the pilot <laughs> and imagine what it would be like taking off into the sky. So this is actually running permanently on my website for Sydney, Australia. Um, and I've just set this up recently for uh, the Bay Area as well. Um, so if you'd like to sort of help out with this project, I'd love to hear from you. Um, but. Um, this was actually when I had one of these tucked away in the seat pocket in front of me without an antenna and I was receiving the transponder from like probably 10 meters below my butt and this is a bit of a hard landing but it's kind of cool because as you taxi in you can see what looks to be the burnt out fuselages of planes. I don't know what Google Earth tried to do there. <laughs> You know how it does the, the terrain exaggeration? They must have some sort of automatic mechanism to determine terrain um, elevation data, but it's kind of a bit weird when you fly through planes like that. Um, and then, so if you do it in Google Earth, then you get the same sort of effect. Um, here the trails don't persist, so it doesn't get as, as, um, as uh, crowded, but you can kind of get a sense when there's a lot of traffic. And you can see when, see, see how it didn't come in on, on the direct path there and uh, around the ocean, it kind of does loops and see there was that loop there. That's when ATC is backed up a little bit and I'm guessing they're asking the planes to sort of hold for a single loop just to give them a little bit of breathing room before they, they vector them in. Um, so what's this one? Oh yeah, this is when the police came out. Hello there. How are you? Good, thanks, and you? Watching airplanes? I am really watching airplanes. That's pretty cool. Do you have any idea? Uh, I do, yes. Is it for like school or something? <laughs> it wasn't wasn't quite for school. But I have to say she was uh, very, very very nice about it. Um, and that's not the first time that I've I've had encounters with the cops, but usually they're pretty good. Um, so the software um, runs in a couple of different stages. This is the desktop application that sort of does the tracking. You've got the decoder that supplies the raw frames, and then you take the, those frames and actually do the tracking. This is the um, main runways at Sydney. You can see the trails the planes have left behind. Um, when I initially got into this, I have to thank my very dear friend back in Australia, Matt Robert. Um, he's worked on OP25. But we went up. Um, I initially was using his USRP1 remotely, and then we would go up to the park and and test it out there because the airport would just be um, within visible distance there in the lights. We went up a couple more times, progressively taking more equipment. We were quite excited this time because that grey plane there isn't actually a plane, it's a vehicle equipped with the transponder. You can see it's on the perimeter road and now recently uh, Sydney Airport has equipped every single one of its cars with transponders. So if you look, you can see these little vehicles moving around and I actually need to change the icon now to something more like a car. 
um, but we were very happy that, that uh, evening. We had quite a bit of equipment up there as well. Um, but you see interesting things, like that was the Queen when she came to visit. Um, the call sign is REGL1, Regal1. Um, and then you see some weird things like, well, I was in San Francisco and I, I saw that. I don't know what that was about. Um, so this is when I, uh, without permission, moved all of my equipment to the roof of the apartment block. And um, I had all, everything stuffed in this sort of box. I had uh, gigabit ethernet and power running down the side of the building, which I had sprayed the same color as the building just to make it invisible. Um, and the software, because you're using SDR, this is the cool thing because you can get at the very lowest le level of the signal. You can in extract information about the distribution of the strengths of the packets coming in and build up these sort of graphs to tell you how well your decoder is doing. This is a, a graph of signal strength versus distance and you can see the way that it drops off. Um, this is altitude versus distance, and because I live close to the airport, they all sort of come to a single point at the bottom left, but you can see the standard flight altitudes out to the right that the planes will eventually ascend to. Uh, and this is a weird one. This is strength versus altitude, and once again, you can see the standard flight paths coming out on the right-hand side there, but on the other axis. Um, this one is Sydney. Now, Australia actually has a greater rollout of ADSB. Uh, in addition to listening to those messages, you see how those balloons are popping up? These are ACARS messages, and ACARS is a system that is like text messaging for aircraft. There's another rainbow effect. But the text messages can be between the cockpit, air traffic control, um, engines might send vibration reports back to Rolls-Royce. Um, I saw once that there had been a rowdy passenger on the plane and they had asked for the federal police to come to the next airport to escort the person off the plane. All sorts of messages, most of it's clear text. Um, and this is, again, pardon? Um, generally, no. no. Um, this is, once again, looking down at Sydney Airport, and you can see when a message is actually sent, it deposits a little um, uh, sort of marker behind, and most messages actually occur at the airport. It's just the way the sort of diagnostic systems work. Um, so I've mentioned all that already. But um, I w listen to the two primary frequencies back home, and I'm, I'm sort of setting that up here as well. But this is the, how the message is sort of printed out. So the, the frequency, the content, the flight ID, registration, and so on. Uh, what does it actually sound like? That's an ACARS message there. And once again, the cool thing with SDR is that this is actually decoding all the three main channels here uh, in the Bay Area simultaneously. So whenever it receives one, you can see that it'll just scroll on the side there and that can be fed into the main system to um, put spatially on the map where the aircraft was when it transmitted that information. So it's also a very interesting sort of diagnostic tool for airline operations, I guess, or if you just like to be a plane spotter. Um, so you can see a whole bunch of en engineering messages which have the H1 label were delivered as it was sort of um, coming into land or pass through the airport. Um, again, this is sort of sped up. You saw a big blue dot there and I'll explain that. Um, but you can see all of the dots appearing uh, uh, as they take off, which is when the plane sends out a whole lot of information um, as it ascends into the sky. Um, so here are some examples. This is kind of a running joke. Uh, I see, probably just because I'm hypersensitive to it now, well, I see ACARS messages regarding blocked toilets on aircraft. So here we have one toilet that's an operative. And I'm guessing lav hard means the lavatory has failed with a hard failure mode. Um, so the galley's flooded and lav hard. And because I see them all the time, I thought, well, I'll make an Easter egg uh, in Google Earth. Uh, and unfortunately, I think the waypoint that's been highlighted there is prawn. So um, the other thing is that they actually send out flight paths over ACARS using waypoints, and I have a database of waypoints, so it actually will draw then the flight paths that the planes will, um, will, should fly through. Uh, I'm only receiving a small portion, but you would expect the plane to fly through to Asia and to Perth on the side of Australia. And also sometimes you see nice things where, I don't know why these planes appear in Google Earth as models, maybe Qantas is paying Google, I don't know, but um, it appears right on top of the cockpit, which is kind of neat. Um, and then, yeah, we talked about the traffic. So you saw that I put all that stuff up on the roof without asking. Um, the Strata sent this message to everybody saying that several tradespeople had installed satellite dishes on the roof. 
So it was just me that installed my home built VHF antenna and um, Modes antenna, which was basically the top of a tin can with a tiny little thing sticking out. And they made a big fuss about it. But two nights before I left for the, to move for the States, I said, stuff them. I put everything in a box like this. Uh, this was the night before I was supposed to get on the plane, installing it at a, at a hut. This is as I was taking off in the plane. I took a photo of where the actual site was. And this is uh, with a little real tech dongle on the flight over here, tracking my plane. Obviously, I wasn't connected to the internet, so I didn't have maps imagery, but um, it was kind of cool to pick up where the plane was. That's more recently in LA. Um, you can get some good range, obviously, when you're nice and high. And this is more recently when I'm setting up the new antennas. Uh, instead of doing only Modest, though, you can use HF. And we were able to receive the HF um, transmissions, which work on a slightly different system, ex extending all the way, as you can see there, into China um, and India. So obviously with HF, you ha have far greater propagation. So the range you can get is, is pretty incredible. Um, so that's more or less aviation. Um, remember, it's all unencrypted, so you can spoof, you can jam, you can do all that kind of stuff, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But, uh, am I doing that? I haven't, I haven't actually looked into that. The, the question was, uh, that, well, there's another part of this called um, um, TISB, which is um, traffic information that's also broadcast over the same sort of mechanism, um, and that's used to sort of augment the information that um, pilots can see. Uh, but it's sort of a next step of the protocol and isn't really widespread, but various sites are sort of bringing it online. Um, but no, I haven't looked at that myself. Um, I haven't, haven't done that, but um, that's actually good for potentially doing multilateration in the absence of um, mode S and ADSB. Um, so moving on to the next one, this is blind signal analysis. So this is where you have no idea what you're actually dealing with. So I was looking at satellites, I happened to go over to a friend's place and hook my um, USRP up to his set-top box that was connected to a satellite. Um, and there are two types of, um, mainly two, two sorts of things to consider. Um, you've got the purpose and the payload, so you can have comms. Was, we saw there were weather satellites, military satellites, amateur radio satellites. The low Earth orbit ones, geostationary ones, uh, and there are the intelligent ones and the dumb ones. So the intelligent ones actually you communicate with them from the ground and instruct them to do things, or there are the dumb ones that just relay information. And it's like a big RF megaphone. So you have a big dish that sends up your million satellite TV channels, and then it broadcasts it back down on spot beams to the ground so that everyone with their little um, satellite TV antenna can watch TV without having to have cable run there. Now, the Optus D1 satellite is just like that. Uh, it operates in these ranges with sort of bandwidth. It's mainly used for television um, with some other interesting narrowband things. And I thought, well, let's, let's have a look at what's going on there. Uh, these are the, the publicly available frequencies, um, how the transponders are broken up, what the telemetry frequencies are. Um, what the uplink power control frequencies are. And this is uh, quite important because uplink power control is a constant um, power signal that comes down to inform the ground of how much power it should send back up. Because depending upon the amount of moisture in the atmosphere, sort of uh, how much, you know, cloud cover and so on, you have to change the amount of transmit power on the ground so that the signal ends up hitting the satellite. Uh, and that has security implications too. Um, so this is actually some publicly available images. This is the, the Earth station where they send the, the signals up. If you look at it on the map, it contains all the sort of TV media um, agencies. Um, if you look at the photo that they took inside, you can, if, with a bit of research, recognize, remember that modem I showed you at the beginning? That rack is full of them. So you can look at the manual. Um, they have some various other sort of more or less um, well-known antenna satellite control systems. So what do you need to actually decode this, these sorts of signals? You need a satellite, you need a dish, um, you need a set-top box or some sort of down converter and an SDR. Um, if you're going to be looking at narrowband stuff, you have to get a down converter that has very high stability. Usually the ones for satellite t TV are very cheap because they're, they can drift quite a bit, but that's okay because the satellite TV signals are very broadband. Um, it's not the case for the narrowband stuff. 
If you actually do a search for the satellite, it happens that the manufacturer of the transponder lists the satellites that the transponder is on board, and then you can look at what kind of modulation will be used for the telemetry downlink. This is actually one of the telemetry signals coming off that satellite. Um, you have the uh, telemetry sidebands, you've got one pulse per second tones, you've got constant subcarrier, um, and this is actually zooming into those telemetry signals. You can demodulate that with GNU radio, and then you can do some visualizations. I didn't look much further than this, but it's kind of cool when you create these raster plots. Who can tell me what these sort of triangular shapes indicate? Counters, exactly. Um, so you can see that there's evidently something going on there, and that might be a starting point. Um, but there are a lot of other narrow band streams coming down from that satellite. So the idea is that you sort of pick one, lock onto it, and try and decode it. Um, the problem is that because you're going in blind, when you initially sent out the signal, you have to specify all these parameters. So if you're multiplexing signals together, if you're scrambling, if, if you're differentially encoding them, if you're doing error correction, modulation, so on, you don't have any idea. So then doing it in reverse, you have to go through all the permutations and it can make your head explode if you know strong bad. Um, so if you don't know, basically you try the most common ones, you try and automate it and try and script it. Um, and the idea is that you can sort of use some hints along the way to determine how successful you're being. Um, so most satellite signals are phase shift keyed, which means that instead of changing the frequency, they change the phase for sort of each one and zero that's sent through, each symbol technically. Um, and so you need to determine what kind of modulation or what sort of order is being used for the phase shift keying, the symbol rate, how quickly they're sending the data through, and you can do this in your new radio quite easily. So I saw these transmissions, I thought, okay, we'll, we'll pick one of those. Um, and then what you do is you can multiply, or rather raise the, the signal itself to a power. So you just like square it or put it to the, the fourth power. And as soon as you get these peaks on the FFT, it actually is indicative of the fact that you've hit the right order of the modulation. So this was actually order four. So we actually have QPSK, which means that in each symbol that's transmitted through this phase shift keyed stream, there are two binary bits. Um, also, we need to find out how quickly they're being sent through. And so you can do this using some simple, what's called cyclostationary analysis, where you multiply the signal by a lagged version of itself and that will reveal any sort of periodic components. And here it turns out to be a good old 9600 board. Um, also, it's forward error corrected, and without figuring out what the convolutional decoder parameters are, you're going to be left with noise. So the idea is that you go through all of them, and then un until uh, you find that the error rate from the actual Viterbi decoder drops to zero. So a Viterbi decoder is designed to decode convolutional codes, but there's this metric, this sort of a special uh, count that it keeps inside, and when you actually f hit the right parameters, that will drop to zero or very close to, and that's the hint that you've been able to identify the right parameters. So you can see there, that drops to zero, which means that I've got the right um, you know, code rate and so on. This is a flow graph that kind of emulates that process. Um, but going through the permutations, GNU Radio is cool because it's open source, you can extend it any way you wish, and instead of me having to click on all of those buttons and try everything out, I made a little block that actually went through them automatically, and then it would go through each permutation, and then it would find that it was locked, and it would just lock onto that. And then I could proceed with the next stage. So I've got now ones and zeros again. Looks like there's a lot of structure in there. Not. But it looks like it's been probably scrambled, which is a common thing to do to sort of whiten the data in case there's sort of any repeating patterns. You want to keep it as, as pseudo-random as you possibly can to send over an RF link. But once you find a good descramble, I just tried a couple of popular ones, turns out that it's still not quite right because you have long runs and ones and zero. So it's probably differentially encoded. So if you differentially decode it, it looks much better. You can see what appears to be repeating patterns and headers and payloads. So now you've got that structure. You can go through the individual bits and search for these repeating patterns. And I discovered sort of this sequence would be repeating all the time, so it's probably going to be some sort of preamble. And then once I would look at the preamble, I was able to find what looked like packets. And it turned out to be some char ancient character-oriented packet um, assembly. So you have the synchronization, bytes, start of header, start of text, end of text, CRC at the end and then a number of fixed length messages within these packets coming down from this satellite. And each contains this ID. So then I wrote a, a parser for that, 
and it would parse them out and group them by ID. And then I discovered these sort of patterns between each successive transmission. And what looked like a header, you would have varying numbers encoded as 16-bit signed images, 8-bit signed, and BCD. And I thought, hmm, what could that possibly be? Well, I have no idea, but if you graph them, they look pretty. <laughs> so I thought, well, they're probably some sort of measurement, maybe, that's proceeding with time. If you plot you know, the x and y, then, then they might move around like this. There might be some sort of telemetry from various sensors placed around the country that are all being uplinked from remote locations to be collected at one central spot. I really am sad that I wasn't able to record more data because I only recorded two minutes worth. But if you would record it for, say, a week or a month, you could then graph this and see how it would change with the time of day, see if it's related to human activity or some sort of natural phenomenon. Um, so more data is always the key. Um, this is a sort of um, uh, TDMA downlink, so I think people with remote satellite terminals are using this sort of shared part of the satellite spectrum there. This was another one that I just could not figure out. It looked like there was something there. You can see that hump there. There might be a signal modulated in there. I was scratching my head. I was running all of these sorts of tricks. Nothing came out of it. And in the end, I, I found some uh, satellite frequency allocation for a US satellite. And it turns out they actually put white noise channels through the satellites to do presumably some sort of RF measurement and testing. So there's actually nothing encoded there. It's just purely white noise. <laughs> so something to bear in. Pardon? Uh, well, if it was one time, then it would, would be digital. So there would still be some sort of digital artifact there. But um, this was well and truly, um, well, as far as I could tell, anyway, why. Um, on back coming down to Earth again, terrestrial signals in HF, STANAG is in military mode, and it's well documented. You can run a similar sort of analysis. It runs at 2400 board. You can see that peak coming out there, which is indicative of the board rate again. Um, if you run the fast sort of correlation, then it matches exactly with the spec in terms of detecting the uh, frame lengths. And so this is a way, once again, if you have a blind signal and you have a database of known parameters, you can sort of look at them and ID them. It's actually 8 PSK this time, so a change in the PSK phase will encode three bits. And if you create the DMOD in GNU Radio, you can see the eight um, sort of points coming out on the constellation there that encode the data. Um, DRM is a really cool digital mode for HF that sends near CD quality, I think it's near CD, audio over HF, so you can get incredible distances, but then have um, really nice digital audio coming out the other side. Um, and it's OFDM, like we mentioned before. This is some MATLAB code that I, I put together from a paper, um, and you can obviously have, create some pretty plots, but looking at the peaks will tell you information about the um, OFDM parameters, so symbol durations and so on. Um, and then what's kind of cool is that it matches up exactly with the class B encoding of DRM because there are different classes A through E, I think, that are used for different protection classes depending upon how far you want to send the signal or how good you want the quality of the audio to be. So once again, it's a good way of sort of figuring things out. Instead of writing MATLAB code, though, I just realized it was easy to create the simple flow graph in GNU Radio where you run the autocorrelation again of this OFDM signal. You see a peak coming out there. You change the lag amount. Remember, with cyclostation analysis, there's, there's a lag. You set that as a lag, and then you see these additional peaks coming out of the additional FFT. And again, that matches up with those exact values that um, we got through the other, other way of doing it. Um, so that's sort of some simple techniques you can use with open source software to try and figure out what a signal is. Um, let's talk about fast track a little bit. I've showed you what it looks like. Um, I've sort of told you about all this already during our, our um, pre-introduction. Um, but the interesting point here, the last one, is that these tags actually do not actively transmit back. What happens is the toll reader will transmit uh, an interrogation, and then it will keep a carrier wave, basically an unmodulated carrier, hitting the fast track tag. And then the microcontroller inside will actually change the load on the internal antenna. And what that means is that the anten internal antenna will kind of take a little bit of that energy um, and then when it you know, modulates a one, say, and then a zero, it won't actually um, absorb that energy and, and it will be reflected back 
to the original um, tag reader. So it's kind of weird that you have the situation where you might have these sort of antennas pointed down and these are both transmitting and receiving at the same frequency at the same time. I hadn't actually kind of played around with this before but um, it's, it's pretty neat and it makes some, some things easier because you're using the signal, single signal, you don't have to worry about kind of transmitting back, it takes more power from the fast track tag because these just contain long life lithium batteries and also then you don't have to worry about synchronization because you, know, you don't have two different clocks that are running in different clock domains. Um, so apart from the actually having antennas at the toll reading booths, there are antennas that sit on street lamps and signposts on the, the highway and apparently they're used for 511 traffic information. And so um, I thought, well, I'll go along and see what I pick up. So that's the antenna, the B200 there and I've got the spectrum coming out on the laptop and that is actually the constant interrogation pulse coming from um, the system. So I recorded that and had a look at it. This is actually uh, um, on the side of the Golden Gate Bridge at the toll booths. I went there um, and I only realised after the fact that I actually parked in, in like, you know, the, the authorities' reserve parking spot, but I was very quick. Um, and so I kind of nestled myself in this bus stop and was, was pointing at the Yagi at the toll tags just to see what I could find. Um, but this, this is the trick, this is the really cool key that makes it all happen. It's, uh, it's this little device here that I, I managed to find on eBay um, and it, it's, it's all about magnets. Um, so it's called a circulator and the idea is that you can send RF energy in one port, it will circulate around to the next port and leave and not continue around to the, any subsequent port. So the transmit energy from the interrogation um, transmitter would go in one, go to two and then go out the antenna. Anything coming back up the antenna, i.e. anything reflected from say a toll tag, will come in two and then exit three and go to the receive side of your radio. Uh, coming, anything coming from the receive side doesn't matter because the receive side won't be transmitting. But this was my little test set up there. You've got the circulator connected to the Yagi that's being kindly supported by that stuffed monkey and the, um, the, ta the tag lent up against the cup. Um, so this is the signal that's being transmitted out as the interrogation signal. Um, and then this is looking at what's coming back in from the antenna. Now, circulators aren't perfect. They won't be able to suppress all of the um, energy sent through, so there will be inevitably some that's passed on to another port if you don't have a matched uh, antenna, for example. Um, but here, uh, on the very left-hand side, you can see there are those uh, lines jumping up and down. This is the payload of the interrogation, so it's identifying with an ID who the interrogator is. And funnily enough, it uses exactly the same modulation as MODES, it's pulse position modulation. And then after that, you kind of have that slightly wavy line emanating out. Just imagine that was flat. This is the constant carrier uh, that should be backscatter modulated by the tag. And so what happens is when I hold the tag up, you can see now something has happened there on that line. If I flip between them, you can see that there is some additional activity, very weak, but there's definitely something there past that interrogation. And then my toll tag has come up. Um, so that's the response. Uh, if you use the good old Wayback Machine, you can find the Department of um, was it Transport's um, spec on this, and then you can implement it. So this screen shows when the preamble is found in the response, and there's this peak from the, from the tuned filter for that preamble. And when it detects a peak in the filter, meaning that a, a backscatter modulated response has been sent by a tag, it activates the decoder here. And then once again, remember we were talking about slicing the pager signal. Once again, we're slicing the response. So the top is one, zero is, is at the bottom. And then we get the binary out and we have a, a payload that we can then CRC check for validity. And then again, completely unencrypted, you have the tag ID. Um, and the flow graph route is relatively simple. There's a transmit chain in there, a receipt. <laughs> Okay, well, I hit all of the really gruesome stuff. Um, but, you know, I like big flow graphs. Uh, you can do them hierarchically as well. There's a cool feature where you can kind of encapsulate stuff. And I get crap about it all the time that I should be using it, but I never do. I just like having it all flat. Um, and if you want to look into it more, I highly recommend that um, Black Hat um, talk that was given. I used quite a bit of that as sort of inspiration and reference um, by Nate Lawson of Root Labs. 
Um, okay, so let's cover direction finding quickly. Um, we have direction. So up till now, we've been talking about the contents of signals, trying to figure out what's actually inside them. This is more about where they're coming from, which can also be used as, as you know, a bit of a key as to you know, what, what's going on, where somebody is. It was originally used for na radio navigation before radar. Uh, it can be used for signals intelligence, uh, emergency aid, if you're trying to find somebody lost somewhere with an emergency beacon, wildlife tracking, obviously, and reconnaissance. And believe it or not, it is actually a sport too. So it was used in World War I and II. The Y stations along the British coastline would try and find uh, the U-boats. And that was quite a successful um, use of the technology. They're much more primitive than what we can do now, but still pretty cool. And apart from um, just sort of VHF and UHF signals that we would normally use, you can have some incredibly large arrays like the one here in Germany. You can see for size comparison, those are cars that are parked in the parking lot at the bottom of the image. So that is an absolutely huge installation. And this is used to, to pinpoint uh, transmissions from all over the globe that are transmitted on HF or long wave. Now, in terms of the sport, you actually had amateurs going out with Yagis and they have these little fox hunts where the transmitters are hidden in the forest or something and they have to try and find it. Uh, so it's a highly directional antenna so that you can pinpoint where the signal is coming from and that's a crazy serious German ham. Uh, so the first, the first way that I initially played around with was called uh, pseudo-Doppler direction finding. And the idea is that you use the Doppler effect to cause a perturbation in the radio waves and then uh, exploit that to figure out where the signal is actually coming from. So I'm sure we all know what the Doppler effect is. As you move an object, it changes the waves. But what you can do is you can actually have, you can see my highly technical and refined wave passing through the center of the circle. Um, the vertical line there on the, um, the um, circumference is actually the antenna. So the idea would be that you rotate the antenna from point A around point B through to point C through the wave, thereby compressing it in frequency. And then as you come out the other way, through D back to A, it's moving the opposite direction and so you expand the wave a little bit. So you end up with this Doppler shift that you can see there in the bottom diagram and that will change the frequency slightly of your signal. Now, the cool thing about it is FM, frequency modulation, relies on this very fact. It will change your carrier wave in frequency depending upon the signal. So what you're doing is you're just adding an extra tone, adding an extra bit of modulation. So this works really well with FM signals. And it means that you can just use any old FM radio or SDR to do the uh, determination of the direction. So the problem is that once you take everything into account, here we have my gratuitous, single gratuitous uh, transition, you would have to rotate that antenna at a ridiculously fast rate that would be physically impossible. So what do you do instead? Well, you do it electronically. You have a fixed array of antennas that don't move, but you actually switch in between them electronically using an antenna switch. And what it means is that instead of having that continuous motion, you do those discrete steps and end up with the same sort of response and you can filter that a little bit to emulate the original continuous motion. So this is kind of your classic homemade RDF. It was a little box, you would hook it up to an existing uh, FM receiver and the LEDs would then indicate the direction that the transmission was coming from. Um, and this is sort of the internal com um, component or system diagram. And the stuff in green um, is all clocked together, which means that it's all synchronous. Remember, you're switching around the antenna, which will mean that a certain frequency is, is introduced into this original signal and you need to focus in on that one frequency to figure out the direction. This is the circuit diagram, just for reference. And then, you know, of course, you're going to look like maybe a little bit weird driving around with all this stuff hanging out of your roof. But hey, that's exactly what I did. So I <laughs> went color, I got an SDR, and um, I wrote a bit of mapping software, and, and I got the Duffmobile happening. So I made my home main uh, antenna array there. So if, you, if we recall this little diagram, all that is done in software. All that is what remains after doing all the rest in software. So this is, uh, these are suction caps that you use to transport uh, windows with. I cut out the tin, soldered some sort of tuned um, elements on top, put it into this antenna switch that I got as a free sample from um, uh, an RF company, and then modified the FPGA code that ran in the, in the USRP1 so that 
the clock that was controlling the actual SDR was also controlling the antenna switch. And the beauty about that is that the frequency then that you get out that reaches the computer uh, is exactly synced to the rate at which the antennas are rotating. So you can narrow in on one specific FFT bin that is guaranteed to be the signal of interest, the Doppler tone, that you can then determine the, the phase from to determine your direction. So this is the receiver. I had two laptops in the car, one doing the tracking, one doing the mapping. Um, the flow graph, uh, I won't go into the details there, but you've got the source coming in, you generate your reference sine wave, and then the Doppler tone you also extract from your incoming RF. And what the trick is that you compare the phase between your reference sine wave and the sine wave that comes in from the Doppler signal. And the difference between those phases will actually give you the direction of your signal. That's the trick. So it's a phase comparison with a known reference wave. So if you look at the FFT of your incoming signal, you see that how you have that peak there? That's the Doppler tone. And so what you do is you take your reference, which might be the blue one, I think, and the green one is your Doppler tone that you've been able to filter out, and then you determine the phase there, and that, excuse me, literally is your direction of arrival of your signal. So I thought, well, we've got to test it. We'll pick an obvious source like that big tower, look up a frequency that um, is at that tower, drive around, X marks the spot for reference, and then every time we drive around, stop, you take a measurement, and then after a while, it kind of ends up sort of roughly... Uh, matching up on the red. The thing is, you have to be really careful because RF is black magic through and through. That hi area highlighted in green was actually when I was coming down from a hill into sort of a, a, a lower portion b b before another hill. And the RF waves would bounce off the back of the hill behind me and creep up sneakily on my array on top of the car. And so the direction that was reported by the system was actually behind me, because that's where the wavefront, the main wavefront, was coming from. And as soon as I came over the, the next hill, I ended up having the direction coming from directly in front of me, which was the correct one, because there was no obstructions. So reflections are very important to deal with um, and uh, to filter out from your measurements. Um, so I repeated it again, this time in Mountain View. Um, that's where um, work formerly was. Uh, and you might know of a big company that is based in Mountain View, and they have cars with all sorts of stuff attached to their roof. So I thought I would pay them a visit with a car with stuff attached to its roof. <laughs> so I went for a drive down Shoreline through Google, um, trying to find, pinpoint this um, particular radio transmission. Um, so that's the Doppler approach. It has some drawbacks. It's OK. Um, but what you can do is you can actually use all the four antennas again and then instead of doing this kind of phase comparison, you can get nitty-gritty down dirty with some serious math. Uh, and one of the popular algorithms uh, is called multiple signal classi classification music. And the idea is it models incoming waves of sinusoids. And then, I won't go into maths here, but you have an, an array response that you compute from your array manifold, which models your antenna setup. And then the peaks there will determine the direction of arrival. So you can imagine those points there on the, on the x-axis of where the antennas are. And as your wavefront comes in, they will all hit each antenna at a slightly different point in time. And then you can determine that phase difference between each individual signal. Um, you, can, you can derp the phase difference. I didn't say derp, did I? <laughs> so maybe I've been talking too long. You can determine, duh, what? <laughs> this is pretty good. <laughs> You're welcome. So this is finding that array response. Um, here I have, I think I had um, just four antennas in a row. Um, you tell the model that you have four antennas in a row, you just express it as a matrix, and then what it, what it does, it'll, it'll go through 360 degrees and simulate what the array response would be. And then when you get the incoming signal, you run that through each particular uh, degree. And then so that goes from 0 to 360 across the bottom. And then you have that peak that matches the exact array response. The advantage is that you get much higher resolution, um, but you need as many radios as antennas now before we only did one radio for four antennas. Um, this is a sort of higher end SDR that um, Edis Research has. It's called the Quad Radio. But I had a little bit of fun with it. You know how you can get those um, Nerf-style USB 
missile launches. So the idea here is that it acquires you and then locks on. So if you, if you look closely, when I move the radio around, it'll track it. Wait for it. I said fire, but there was no audio. Maybe it was turned down. I said fire, and when it detects that, it shoots you. Um, so I, I set it up there again. Um, you know, this is not, not the cheapest SDR, but I just chucked it in the, in the boot with a big uh, SLA battery to keep it powered while I was driving around. Um, and so here, just to do a calibration test, you can see that as I walk around the car, the compass tracks my, my movement. Um, so if I go for a little drive here, then once again, I've repeated that, that um, route through Google's campus, but you know, it's, I've picked some other frequency and I guess it's kind of keeping pretty good track of it, except for there down below. But you know, though, as I said, those errors creep in because of reflections. If you're in an urban area with no line of sight to your transmitter, then it'll reflect off other buildings, just like um, the reflections from that primary surveillance radar as well. Um, and this is the GNU radio block that you can download and if you, you know, have some sort of other setup where you might um, connect two of these together with a, a, a single reference, um, you can create the similar sort of thing. All right, police checklist, if you're going to be driving around like this, make sure you have your radio paper, amateur radio license helps. Um, I had some antenna structural redundancy by having a string that I put through each of the um, suction caps just in case one would fly off. I can't really drive more than 40 miles an hour because then I get some serious vibrations in the, in the tin. It's kind of, kind of scary. Um, it's good to be clean shaven, I guess. Um, and if you have any radios that are in fact used by the police, like the Motorola XTS radios, it's always good to hide them because Unfortunately, m many of them, or at least some of them, don't know that they can be used as legitimate ham radios. Uh, so they get very suspicious when they see, you know, what are you listening to, uh, listening to the cops or what's going on? Um, and then, because I had all these wires coming in, I couldn't actually open the door because it was coming in through the window. Um, so if you sort of turn around and just try and disconnect all the wires in the back, it, it looks a bit sus. So take it from me. Um, all right, so, so more security stuff. Do not try this wherever you are. So with pages, if you don't like a doctor, I'll read the first bit and then you can read the next bit. Is your arch nemesis in hospital? <laughs> Need to distract security. So these automated alerts were sent out. Um, I can't even quite remember now, but it was some, something to do with the rotation of guards or, or shift changes, something like that. So with mode S, do you want to reach cruising altitude a little quicker? <laughs> so as I said, with all of these things, they're all unencrypted. It's illegal to transmit, but all the protocols are there and you can implement it with, with these sorts of tools. Do you think the pilot made the wrong choice in deciding to land? <laughs> Do you want to display a message on everyone's radar screen? So you know there's ASCII art. If you send out enough transponders with different IDs, then you could probably spell something. Uh, do you want, so this is ACARS now, so this is the text messaging for the aircraft. Do you not want to fly on a particular aircraft? So these things are automatically sent by the avionics systems. They're incredibly, um, you know, complex and, and and they're in their self-checks, and it's, it's really interesting to see the sort of reports that they send out. Uh, was the flight that you were on a little bumpy? <laughs> RR is Rolls-Royce. Um, do you want to message the cockpit privately? <laughs> so in the spec, I, if I recall correctly, there are four assigned labels that address the four supposed cockpit printers. I doubt they print paper anymore, but I would be pretty certain that a message might be displayed on one of the, the, um, the displays. So for satellites, um, as I was saying, there's that uplink power control that controls the amount of power that then is sent up by the ground station. 
So it's usually kept at a minimum because it costs a lot of power to send up kilowatts. Usually if the sky is clear, you can just send a few watts and it's much cheaper for the part of the transmitter. So it depends on the weather as we established. Um, heavy rain, a few kilowatts cost more. We want to keep the cost down. So what you can do is you can turn your signal a little bit higher than theirs. And it actually says this in the satellite manual that, damn it, I can't read it. Sorry, a malfunctioning uplink power control system can interfere with other services and even damage a satellite traveling wave tube amplifier. This is the fancy amplifier in the RF megaphone that amplifies the weak signal from Earth and sends it back down. If you end up sending a higher power signal than what the amplifier can take, it will probably bust, and it's very unlikely they'll be able to go up and fix it. So you can put, you know, it's possible, uh, therefore, to wipe out one of the complete transponders using that. Um, but you know, you need some pretty serious equipment to do that. Um, and so fast track, you don't want to ever pay a toll again in your life. Um, you know, this only goes over a short distance, but if you potentially hooked up a 900 megahertz amplifier, you could go over an overpass and then interrogate everyone who passed underneath you. Um, <clears throat> you want traffic management to think there's some sort of auto stampede happening on the highway? <laughs> you can just stand there and then basically respond with everyone else, everyone's tag. Do you want to keep tabs on someone? Just you know, set up your reader wherever you want and see if they drive past. So a bit of privacy concerns there. I mean, that's the thing, right? You drive up the highway. It says in fine print in the fast track thing that you will be read at other locations for other purposes like you know, traffic monitoring and so on. But I don't think anybody really knows that. And how long do they keep the data for? What's their retention policy? With all that's been going on lately, does it get aggregated into you know, other databases? Probably. Um, so. Don't forget that um, you know, if you ever get bored, say if you get bored of the baseball, there's always SDR to keep you company. <laughs> um, so yeah, the most important thing is be legal and be safe. Only transmit in the bands that you can. You'll have mobile phones. You automatically get a license to transmit in the cell bands. Um, you can get an amateur radio license and transmit in the amateur bands and do experimental stuff there. But uh, elsewhere is not a good idea. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, if you'd like to know any more information, um, I put a lot of RF stuff on my wiki. Uh, my main website sort of documents my main projects. Um, a lot of things like the direction finding and additional blocks for GNU Radio and stuff I, I keep on my GitHub. I'll be pushing the fast track stuff. Um, and if you want to email me personally or at my work address, then they're my um, emails and my Twitter handle. Uh, um, yeah, I, I sent a huge deck to um, DEF CON, so it should be on the CD. Um, I have an older version of these on my wiki. Um, this, the deck that I showed you today has been significantly upgraded, but you know, in, in time I'll, I'll post those as well as the videos and things like that. Uh, and yeah, if you have any questions, please come and find me and talk to me.